Well, hello. Uh, welcome to a uh, resident level lecture on surgical pathology of the vagina. Um, our uh, efforts today are coming to you from the campus of the University of Oklahoma, and uh, we'll uh, discuss a number of things. Uh, but here are some of the principal objectives that I have to help you in your uh, education and uh, dealing with uh, specimens arising from the vagina. Uh, first of all, we'll look at the surgical pathology entities that we see here and contrast them a little bit with what uh, uh, perhaps is more commonly seen in the vulva and cervix. Uh, staging considerations, of course, will come in where we're dealing with uh, neoplasms uh, that require that. And then uh, we'll touch on some of the differential diagnostic considerations that uh, can concern us in this, uh, set, uh, this area of the body. Uh, first of all, we'll begin with the benign entities that may be confused with malignant ones. And this is perhaps the most uh, clinically important part of the lecture, uh, because uh, certainly you don't want to go down that uh, trap of uh, giving someone a malignancy uh, when in reality they have a very benign condition. So the first of these is what's uh, been termed vaginal adenosis. Um, historically, this has a very clear-cut association with diethyl silvestrol exposure in utero, uh, but there are other factors that may also predispose to that. And the, typically, this occurs in the upper one-third of the vagina and consists basically of simple columnar epithelium, um, mucinous, ciliated, et cetera, et cetera, uh, within the wall of the vagina. Uh, there may be then subsequently squamous metaplasia, and uh, this, uh, of course, expose, or, uh, leaves a patient with an increased risk of uh, carcinoma. Uh, on gross examination, it looks sort of like this. And you can see this areas of abnormal uh, mucosa here with this sort of strawberry uh, stippled color uh, that has uh, shifted uh, the uh, normal configuration of the uh, um, vaginal mucosa. Uh, this is, of course, distal to the cervix here. Um, and extending further into the vagina. Under the microscope, it can have a variety of uh, appearances. Here's a fairly simple glandular pattern, simple serous or mucinous type of epithelium with a delicate stroma uh, and no, uh, no particular cytologic atypia. Uh, this is the microglandular pattern. There are other patterns that can be seen, uh, such as this uh, with a simple uh, glandular pattern. And often this uh, close association uh, with squamous epithelium is uh, remark remarked um, in uh, the findings. So uh, this uh, can be missed um, and uh, overlooked, uh, which should not occur, uh, but also can be the source of cystic dilatation or potentially uh, confusion or upstaging of patients with cancers elsewhere uh, or with a concern for malignancy. Uh, here's another example with uh, mucinous epithelium. Uh, again, very simple columnar epithelium, bland nuclei. Uh, this is simple vaginal adenosis. Uh, here's one with a little bit of uh, tubal type epithelium. You can see the cilia uh, and terminal bars in this uh, area. Uh, and this also can classify as adenosis. Uh, squamous uh, epithelium, uh, as I mentioned, can, can occur with uh, metaplastic changes uh, occurring subsequently. Um, and so in patients who have a uh, sort of squamoid type lesion, somewhat nodular, uh, consideration of vaginal, ad vaginal adenosis with secondary uh, squamous metaplasia should be considered. Uh, vaginal cysts uh, occur in a variety of settings uh, in addition to adenosis, which we've just uh, mentioned. Uh, simple Mullerian remnants or mesonephric uh, remnants can occur. Uh, epithelial type inclusions, maybe post-surgical or postpartum can occur. And then you can get endometriotic cysts as well. We mentioned mesonephric cysts. Uh, so here's a uh, uh, Mullerian type cyst, uh, endocervical type epithelium here, uh, but tubal or other endometrioid types could uh, uh, occur with this as well. And again, as I've mentioned, adenosis can be the precursor for this type of lesion. Here's a, sort of a mesonephric uh, cyst, a lateral wall, um, and uh, this would have been uh, considered a Gartner's dusk, duct type cyst uh, with very, very low cuboidal mesonephric type of uh, epithelium, such as we'd see in the lateral wall of the, of the uh, cervix from time to time. Now, occasionally, uh, 
prolapsed fallopian tube can enter into the differential here. Uh, here's an example of a inflamed uh, fimbriated end of the uh, uh, fallopian tube, which may occur in a patient who has a vaginal hysterectomy uh, for other causes. Um, and then just a little fragment of the tube uh, ends up uh, uh, adherent or involved in the, the wall or the healed scar from that uh, surgical procedure. And oftentimes that will become inflamed and uh, can look uh, uh, like uh, maybe a neoplasm or other lesions in the apex of the vagina. Now, uh, another important lesion to consider is the so-called postoperative spindle cell tumor. Uh, first described in the, uh, well, I believe the late 1980s. Uh, the vagina is a very common location for this, as it would be the urethra, bladder, and other uh, urogenital sites uh, in this area. Uh, typically, these present in uh, the first few weeks following surgery, um, and they look uh, can look quite concerning. They're positive with uh, mesenchymal markers, uh, maybe occasionally cytokeratin, uh, as well as desmin, actin, and so forth. Um, and occasionally ulceration and other so-called malignant features can be seen. Uh, the clue to the diagnosis, of course, is this uh, tissue culture type of appearance, a very fascicular pattern, very cellular, very mitotically active, uh, frequent mitotic figures, um, and obviously the history, presentation in a period of time closely approximating uh, prior surgery for other types of disease. Uh, now, in this situation, the differential diagnosis can uh, become quite broad and considerations of malignancy can ensue. So things like leiomyosarcoma or sarcomatoid carcinoma enter into the, to the discussion, but usually those don't present uh, within a matter of weeks. Uh, uh, and so um, the lack of atypical mitosis and the lack of any history of those uh, lesions um, or the lack of a history of prior surgery uh, would be an important differential. Uh, vaginal fibroepithelial polyps uh, can look uh, much like uh, some sarcomatoid lesions. Uh, these typically present in the reproductive and postmenopausal age groups. Um, there may be a history of hormone use or even pregnancy at the time. Uh, they can uh, be single or multiple and have this sort of pseudobotrioid appearance. Uh, making them uh, a ringer for potentially uh, 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 botryoid uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. Uh, and the surface epithelium may occasionally appear uh, dysplastic or have HPV effects. So here's an example, grossly sort of a wart-like or uh, bulbous uh, polypoid lesion. Sometimes they have a more glistening grape-like appearance, the uh, botryoid uh, type. And characteristically, they often have uh, a slightly atypical stroma. Uh, this uh, multi-nucleate giant cells or smudged nuclei, uh, occasional bizarre cells uh, in the stroma of these lesions is quite typical. Here's a higher magnification view, and you can see there's uh, florette cells, uh, multi-nucleate cells, and this wavy collagenous background. Um, these may be positive for hormone markers, as well as uh, vimentin and desmin, of course. Um, but they usually do not have atypia uh, beyond uh, this uh, level, and they certainly would not have mitoses. Um, but they can still be quite uh, concerning, uh, particularly if they have a more sarcomatoid and more pleomorphic type cell, uh, cell uh, appearance, as it can occasionally be seen. Um, the differential diagnosis of these lesions, of course, would occur include rhabdomyosarcoma, solitary fibrous tumor, endometrial stromal sarcoma. Uh, the aggressive angiomyxomas usually do not have this degree of uh, cytologic atypia, but certainly that uh, uh, those entities, uh, superficial myofibroblastomas, would come into the differential considerations because of the vasculature, maybe the cellularity, and so forth. So this shows you the, the degree of cellularity that can be seen. Notice here there's no uh, Grun zone. There's no accentuation in the subepithelial zone as well. Tubulosquamous polyps uh, are usually seen in postmenopausal women and uh, occur uh, in the upper vagina. Uh, they can include uh, glycogenated epithelium uh, with some keratinization, um, and they, may, they usually have this sort of tubular pattern, sort of an inverting papilloma type of appearance. 
Um, interestingly, um, on occasion, these are found to have prostatic markers, including PSA, uh, as well as uh, hormonal prop, uh, markers. The differential diagnosis will include Brenner tumor and uh, so-called benign mixed tumor, uh, which we'll show in a, in a moment. So here's what one of these uh, looks like. You can see, again, the, the bland surface epithelium and these sort of mixed tubular glands with uh, squamous differentiation, some cystic change, um, uh, as you can see here sort of like uh, von Brunn's nests with cystic change, uh, perhaps, uh, or as we've uh, indicated, they may have prostatic markers. Um, now, uh, a lesion that uh, usually is not a, a tremendous problem to identify, but may be related to various prior surgical or interventional uh, situations. Uh, hysteroscopy, for example, is vaginitis emphysematosa, or if essentially emphysematous vaginitis. Uh, these uh, have variably sized cystic spaces, and note that there may be occasional lining giant cells and histiocytes. Uh, this presumably occurs with insufflation of air into the uh, mucosa uh, and a foreign body reaction to that uh, air or uh, whatever was contained with the air. Endometriosis, of course, is uh, very common, especially in sites of trauma. Um, uh, this uh, post-delivery, uh, uh, post-surgical uh, side of one, uh, one sort or another uh, could be a precursor lesion for endometriosis. Uh, it's generally uh, not uh, related to intraperitoneal or pelvic uh, endometriosis. Uh, differential diagnosis would include vaginal adenosis. Uh, and as with endometriosis in other sites, uh, there is a risk of neoplasia. And so, uh, especially if the person is, uh, uh, has prolonged hormonal stimulation, that uh, risk should be considered. Here's a sort of polypoid endometriosis. You can see this sort of projections uh, up from the wall uh, with a spongy type of uh, epithelia or uh, mucosa here. And here under the microscope, you can see squamous lining with underlying polypoid proliferating endometriosis. So if it's hormonally responding, it's gonna proliferate and produce uh, potentially a polyp in this uh, location. Uh, here's another example of something uh, sort of simulating adenosis. Um, as you see a mass-like lesion sort of loss of uh, uh, this normal surface uh, mucosa uh, and underlying here the uh, endometrial stroma and glands. So in contrast to adenosis, with endometriosis, you'll see the striking stroma of endometriosis, whereas in adenosis, you can have endometrial type glands, but you should not see the type of stroma that we associate with endometriosis. Another benign lesion that can occasionally pop up in the uh, uh, vagina is malacoplakia, uh, although it's certainly much more common in other uh, urogenital sites. Um, it shouldn't be uh, lost to consideration if you have uh, histiocytoid cells and occasional uh, small karyorectic uh, bodies that may uh, mimic uh, or look like uh, Michaela Scutman bodies. So let's talk about some of the benign tumors that can occur in the uh, uh, vagina. Um, Mullerian papilloma of infancy. Um, this is not one I have much personal experience with. Uh, but uh, uh, certainly uh, Mullerian type uh, surface epithelium, uh, maybe a lateral uh, or, or polypoid appearance in this uh, uh, age group would be uh, uh, suitable to make that diagnosis. A mixed tumor or spindle cell epithelioma um, is uh, fairly uncommon as well. Um, it's an adult lesion, but typically presents near the hymenal ring. So this location is uh, quite critical. Um, and the morphology will be that of uh, spindle cells with intersecting fascicles, uh, some nests and hyaline spherules with a uh, biphenotypic uh, um, immunohistochemical uh, profile, epithelial markers as well as mesenchymal mar markers. Um, so there are relatively few things that give that, uh, but this is one of the benign entities which can have this uh, uh, dual phenotypic uh, characteristics. Uh, 
um, considering endometrial stromal tumors, uh, um, you know, malignant mixed mullerian tumors, uh, lyomyoma or so forth. Uh, but this location in the distal vagina uh, is very typical for this uh, spindle cell epithelioma or mixed tumor. Here's what the, it looks like under the microscope. You see an intact uh, epithelium above, a uh, grunt zone or, or free zone, and then this fairly cellular tumor uh, with uh, some sort of epithelioid clustering of uh, cells, a very sharply circumscribed border. Um, and then here we see the epithelial uh, elements as well as the stromal elements uh, that uh, constitute this uh, mixed tumor. And note, note the fascicular architecture of the stromal cells. Uh, here's another example with a more uh, sort of chondroidish or uh, myoepithelial type of uh, stroma, uh, more akin to what we might see in a mixed tumor elsewhere in the upper aerodigestive tract or uh, respiratory tract. And then we again see these uh, uh, epithelial nests with sort of a squamoid appearance. Uh, here's an example of the immunohistochemistry, noting the cytokeratin positivity, uh, even in the spindle cells. Um, and uh, uh, that would, of course, be true as well in the uh, uh, epithelial nested components. Uh, smooth muscle tumors, uh, of course, can occur uh, anywhere. Uh, we have uh, benign smooth muscle, which we do in the uh, vagina. Uh, Lyomyoma is the most common mesenchymal tumor. Um, and of course, uh, the usual criteria that we would use uh, to differentiate from lyomyosarcoma are those that we've used uh, elsewhere in the gynecologic tract. And you can refer to one of our other videos on uh, that topic on smooth muscle tumors. Uh, here's uh, an example of uh, lyomyoma with bizarre nuclei. Um, this is a relatively uh, uh, uncommon type of lyomyoma, but uh, as we noted in the uterus, it can occur. And it's important to uh, prefer the term bizarre nuclei rather than atypical nuclei uh, so that uh, people are not concerned about uh, malignancy or premalignant uh, behavior in this very benign lesion. Rhabdomyoma. Uh, is a rare tumor, uh, but uh, the vagina is the most common gynecologic site. So uh, if you're going to see it, you'll look for it in the vagina, uh, but most likely you'll not encounter one uh, in your practice. Uh, uh, differentially diagnosis would include fibroepithelial polyp and rhabdomyosarcoma. Uh, characteristic findings are not difficult uh, unless you just are not thinking of it or don't know about it. So seeing these strap type cells with bland benign type nuclei and uh, maybe some cross striations if you uh, sort of hallucinate and so forth um, uh, would uh, constitute enough uh, criteria to call this a rhabdomyoma. Of course, that will probably generate a phone call and concern, did you leave out the rhabdomyosarcoma component or whatever, and if you can reassure them that it's benign um, in this setting. So let's move on to the uh, more malignant lesions and uh, spiral upwards into uh, the things that we are concerned about um, and spend uh, so much of our time on as surgical pathologists um, confronting uh, cancers. So uh, of course, uh, the uh, squamous epithelium is the hotbed of activity when it comes to malignancy in the vagina. And we've uh, discussed uh, some of the uh, grading of uh, dysplasias or intraepithelial neoplasias uh, in other videos. Um, and the same uh, conundrums uh, present themselves uh, in the vagina. Um, the same differentials are there in the vagina. Um, and so uh, the last uh, anogenital you know, classification project uh, should include the vagina uh, in terms of classifying things in a two-grade system, low-grade versus high-grade. Uh, but uh, sometimes there are things that are difficult to, to know whether they're low-grade or high-grade. Um, and the criteria that you use uh, are important. I'll refer you to my video on uh, the uh, classification of uh, cervical intraepithelial neoplasias uh, under the three-grade three uh, criteria um, and uh, encourage you to apply those in the vagina as well. Uh, so here's an example of uh, 
what has been called vaginal intraepithelial neoplasia grade three on the basis that they see atypia in the uppermost layers. Um, under the conventional criteria, I think many would classify this as grade one uh, or even, you know, or maybe grade two at most. Um, so uh, although this is labeled as VAN3, I think uh, under most uh, conventional practitioners' uh, opinions, this would uh, still classify as a grade one type lesion, unless you were to find elsewhere mitotic figures in the mid zone or an atypical mitotic figure. Um, so we've made this point, cervical, vaginal, vulvar dysplasias have similar criteria. Um, vaginal intraepithelial neoplasia in general is less common than that seen in either the cervix or the vulva, um, and usually is uh, found predominantly in older individuals, where, uh, of course, atrophy comes into the differential and can sometimes mask that uh, um, issue. Certainly people who have a, an, uh, a history of intraepithelial neoplasia elsewhere uh, should be uh, considered at high risk and uh, certainly monitored colposcopically for that uh, as appropriate. Uh, here's a uh, squamous carcinoma occurring in the, uh, here's the uterus here on the right, and you see this uh, uh, squamous epithelial tumor uh, arising from the vaginal wall uh, in a combined vaginal hysterectomy specimen. Here's another example in a pure vaginectomy specimen. Uh, you can see this uh, altered mucosa areas of sharp demarcation, sort of cobblestoning and pebbling, ulceration, and uh, maybe a little bit of mass formation in some areas. Uh, microscopically, again, the criteria for squamous uh, neoplasia is similar to what we would use elsewhere. Uh, atypical keratinizing cells or uh, Con condensed uh, various other types of uh, lesions, um, as well as other uh, histologic uh, categories, basosquamous, et cetera, et cetera. Um, sarcomatoid car squamous carcinoma does not, however, uh, unlike other areas, carry the, the same favorable prognosis. So when you find a squamous carcinoma with sarcomatous uh, stroma, uh, that's usually a, a, a not a favorable sign. Uh, verrucous carcinomas uh, occasionally will also occur in the, in the uh, vagina, uh, have a very exophytic uh, pattern, of course, as typical of that, and a minimally uh, pushing type border uh, that can uh, be uh, a challenge to evaluate. Uh, in terms of prognostic uh, features, uh, of course, staging is the most important. Survival in stage one is uh, excellent, uh, as opposed to disseminated disease, uh, not usually a curable disease. Um, size, older age, vascular invasion, usual high risk factors that we think about, um, and again, uh, HPV status. So uh, akin to the uh, vulva, uh, where differentiated VIN uh, leading to uh, um, <clears throat> uh, P53 mutated uh, tumors, uh, these are going to do more poorly uh, than uh, the HPV related ones. Now, because the vagina is adjacent to the vulva and the cervix, which more commonly have uh, um, uh, dysplasias and neoplasias, uh, not infrequently, the, the vagina will end up being in the radiation field. Um, and it's important to then recognize that radiation change uh, can be sometimes quite deceptive. Uh, here we see it sort of masked as a low-grade lesion, and here uh, almost mimicking a high-grade, well, very much mimicking a high-grade type of lesion, but both of these are uh, radiation-related changes. So let's talk about adenocarcinomas uh, in the vagina. Um, as we've mentioned, the adenosis is a, a precursor, but here on the right, we've uh, indicated the various types that can be seen, endocervical type, endometrioid type, clear cell, uh, intestinal type, uh, and mucinous types, serous, rarely mesonephric, and then just um, uh, not otherwise specified, not, not individually uh, characterized. So let's talk about clear cell carcinoma. Um, this uh, came to light uh, uh, in the, uh, when uh, women exposed to uh, DES in utero uh, began to mature and uh, they developed clear cell carcinomas at a fairly young age. Now, of course, DES use has uh, diminished, uh, 
And with it, uh, the incidence of clear cell carcinomas of the vagina uh, have uh, plummeted to almost zero. Um, it is important to note that uh, high survival is possible in the sporadic cases, uh, but uh, even in the, D in the DES uh, cases, uh, the survival seemed to be uh, more favorable than in the more sporadic uh, lesions that we see now. Uh, under the microscope, uh, here's glandular adenosis, which uh, can have sort of a clear cell hyperplasia type of appearance. Uh, and you, you don't want to mistake that for uh, either uh, um, clear cell carcinoma uh, or other benign lesions, areostella reaction, and so forth. Uh, so this is a more benign appearing lesion, uh, and you, unless you were to go to high magnification and see uh, marked atypia. So here's the high magnification, and we can see that here we have nuclear atypia that's fairly high grade. We have some hobnail type cells, and then we also have a mixture of other adenosis elements in and amongst these glands. Clear cell carcinoma of the vagina does appear similar to the counterparts that we see elsewhere, but as I've tried to emphasize here in bold letters, it has a different prognosis. Um, and uh, so um, it's an important distinction to make. Immunohistochemically, um, it uh, can be uh, similar in many respects to clear cell carcinomas elsewhere. Uh, the HM. HDMA uh, marker as well as NAPS and A will usually be positive here as well. Um, and uh, the other histologic markers that may be employed, uh, variable HER2 staining, estrogen receptor, P53 mutation, quite variable uh, in this location. So moving on to transitional cell carcinoma, this is uh, again, fairly uncommon in the vagina, but does occur. Uh, it can be a pure in type or mixed with other elements. Um, and the immunohistochemistry can be very similar to what we'd see in the bladder or variable, uh, positive, negative uh, with 20 uh, or positive with both. Uh, some of these have been associated with uh, squamous uh, intraepithelial lesions and positive HPV. Uh, most of them are uh, non-invasive, sort of exophytic papillary tumors. So here's what that uh, looks like. Uh, and uh, you can see that this has a, um, a papillary morphology that could be seen as uh, being a high, high sill type of uh, lesion, very cellular, no maturation type of appearance, but recognizing it as transitional, either due to nuclear grooves or other transitional type elements uh, can be uh, important. Um, and as we've indicated, the uh, immunohistochemistry will be uh, somewhat different uh, than that of uh, squamous lesions. Um, neuroendocrine carcinomas uh, can also occur uh, in the uh, vagina. Uh, here's an example, a gross image uh, been stained with uh, ink, marking inks and then realized later that oh, we should take a picture of this. Uh, note the very granular nature of the uh, surface uh, in this case. And uh, under the microscope, uh, these uh, will look like nested neuroendocrine uh, lesions uh, that we see elsewhere. Um, Low-grade, uh, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor is not a defined category uh, within the vagina at this point. Uh, these are not uh, common tumors, and so uh, uh, extensive classification and alignment of the classification of these tumors with uh, uh, sites where neuroendocrine tumors are more common uh, still uh, awaits uh, further. Uh, development. Uh, the differential, uh, importantly, can include basaloid squamous carcinomas. Um, and so here's a, a nice example of how very similar these lesions can look. Um, is this a basaloid squamous carcinoma or is it a neuroendocrine carcinoma? Well, very often it's, you're going to want to do the immunohistochemistry to define it uh, as such. And I would certainly recommend that uh, approach uh, be uh, liberally applied. In terms of reporting, uh, we certainly are grateful that the uh, Surgical Pathology Committee at the uh, CAP has uh, uh, provided us with a uh, up-to-date uh, uh, protocol uh, with all of the latest uh, uh, um, prognostic uh, markers that need to be included uh, and parameters that we should be included. Uh, this slide obviously uh, dates uh, back a few years, uh, 
uh, but there is a, a more recent update from 2019 and 2020 uh, that you should uh, apply today. Now, uh, a couple of notes uh, to uh, point, point up um, is that um, uh, the vagina kind of gets second uh, weak sister approach here. Uh, whenever there's a, a simultaneous tumor involving the cervix or the vulva, uh, the tumor is considered to have originated from the cervix or vulva, respectively, with secondary extension. So um, uh, the vagina doesn't get a primary site designation unless it does not involve or extend to uh, the vulva or the uh, uh, cervix. Uh, intestinal type uh, adenocarcinomas, uh, and so you have to be aware of this type of lesion. Uh, even some gastric type uh, adenocarcinomas uh, can occur primarily there. So be, be wary before you uh, jump to the conclusion that the patient has a uh, metastasis. Now, a tumor that's not included in the CAP checklist is the embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. Uh, this is a pediatric uh, tumor, uh, typically occurring in the first few years of life, uh, and has a very uh, characteristic, uh, immun uh, excuse me, characteristic morphologic appearance as well as gross appearance. Uh, it has the so-called cambium layer of uh, very dense cellularity just beneath the uh, uh, epithelium with uh, very mitotically active uh, cells uh, and then uh, more uh, deeper matured la layer as well. Uh, beneath that is the less cellular edematous zone and uh, occasionally you can have heterologous elements like cartilage uh, in these tumors as well. That's why my pediatric pathology colleagues uh, uh, love these tumors is because they're so heteromorphous. So here's the uh, sort of botryoid appearance, uh, the em embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma botryoides, as it's called uh, in the older literature. Uh, and you can see these grape-like clusters of uh, tumor uh, in the, involving the vagina. Under the microscope, uh, here's uh, what this looks like, uh, these rounded uh, uh, structures of uh, squamous epithelium on the surface with the uh, cellular uh, stroma uh, that's more condensed in the uh, subepithelial zone, and then more deeply we would see the uh, cambium type layer. Now occasionally these uh, sarcomatous uh, cells from the cambium layer will actually invade into the epithelium in a sort of pagetoid like pattern. Um, so if you're concerned about Paget's disease in an infant, it's not likely to be Paget's disease, it's more likely to be uh, sarcoma botryoides. Uh, and as I mentioned, here's the hetero heterologous uh, collagen, excuse me, a, a cartilage that can occur in these uh, lesions as well. Um, here's the uh, small round tumor cells, the rhabdomyoblasts, um, and a little bit more strap-like or uh, spindle-shaped cells uh, on the left. So another uh, lesion that we want to be concerned about is the so-called uh, aggressive angiomyxoma uh, uh, that we have seen uh, in the vulva and des described uh, uh, in some detail in one of our other videos. Uh, this uh, lesion uh, can be uh, challenging but because it can have a very superficial component, but it can extend very deeply into the pelvic tissues. And so it can involve the vagina or originate near or in the vagina and extend to involve uh, uh, pelvic tissues elsewhere. Uh, this is not a very characteristic uh, field for that lesion. I'd refer you to our uh, case uh, uh, presentation on that um, in one of our other videos. Um, melanoma, we've discussed melanomas of the vulva uh, and uh, ure urethra. Uh, of the vulva and urethra, but they can also occur in the vagina as well um, with uh, many of the typical morphologic features helping you there as they would elsewhere. Uh, here's uh, an example of a more epithelioid type with nested uh, cells, but not very cohesive. And the somewhat uh, eccentrically placed nuclei, uh, maybe a few uh, cherry red nucleoli would be visible if you could uh, zoom in uh, on this uh, remarkably. Um, another pediatric uh, tumor uh, that can occur in the uh, vagina is the yolk sac tumor. Um, we've discussed yolk sac tumor elsewhere in the uh, gynecologic tract, and the morphologies in the uh, vagina are similar. Uh, 
Uh, here's a, an example of the reticular pattern, uh, these varied uh, cystic spaces with variable uh, amounts of uh, interlacing uh, uh, neoplastic cells uh, bridging around and through and lining those uh, spaces. Um, other patterns can be seen as well. Uh, here's another uh, component of the reticular pattern. Uh, note the characteristic hyaline droplets that are uh, typical of this uh, tumor. Uh, we've mentioned the Schiller-Duval body uh, and other uh, teaching sessions that uh, doesn't have to be seen to make this diagnosis. Uh, your immunohistochemical markers can help you. Uh, you can have other variants uh, of that as well that can be seen. Um, and I'll refer you to those in detail elsewhere. Uh, so lymphomas also can involve the vagina, um, either as a primary site or secondarily. Um, this is a predominantly large cell lymphoma with a few admixed small cells here. I note that some of these large cell lymph lymphomas can appear very much like a poorly differentiated carcinoma. And so uh, remember doing, remembering to include that in your differential and when you're doing a broad panel of stains uh, to not neglect the uh, CD45 or the CD20 or CD3 to, to raise the possibility of lymphoma. Uh, here's pagetoid invasion of the vaginal epithelium by a transitional neopl neoplasm. So you can get uh, sort of pagus disease uh, that extends down the urethra and can uh, in turn spread up into the vagina as well as onto other areas of the vulva. Uh, this is a rare occurrence, but uh, it, it happens. So we, uh, we mention it. There are other stromal uh, sarcomas that can occur uh, in the vagina. You can get uh, stromal sarcoma, the endometrial type, uh, either related to prior uh, um, uh, endometriosis or perhaps uh, de novo, uh, peripheral nerve sheath tumors, angiosarcomas, other primary sarcomas that you associate with other sites uh, can also occur uh, in the vagina as their primary site. There are a few more rare birds to consider. Uh, Brenner tumor, uh, fatwa, uh, occasionally will occur in this location. We've talked about that. Picomas, uh, again, we've got a video about that one. Uh, myoepithelioma, gastrointestinal stromal tumor, uh, remarkably rare. Um, and so if, if you're lucky enough to see one, uh, hopefully you will have uh, thought about it and uh, heard about it here first. So let's uh, just take a moment or two and review some of the things we've covered. Um, here is an example of some polypoid lesions, or a polypoid lesion, you see it bisected here, uh, sort of crimped here from the biopsy, and you see it's got a stock, uh, sort of myxoid uh, type stroma. Uh, the thing to that is remarkable to me is that uh, this same lesion could occur in a child, uh, and you'd be thinking, you know, sarcoma botryoides. If it occurs in an adult, you might be thinking of uh, fibroepithelial polyp. You, in, an, uh, in an older patient, you might be thinking of uh, potentially a malignant lesion uh, or a more adult type lesion. So uh, remember that the age can uh, determine the kind of uh, uh, differential that you want to in, uh, include. So quickly as we review, low power image, squamous epithelium, benign intermixed glandular appearance, you're gonna think glandular vaginal adenosis. Uh, and if you do that, you're right. Um, distal vagina, 25 years old, two centimeter lesion, mixed sort of epithelial and myoepithelial type lesion. What should you be thinking? Of course, mixed tumor of the vagina. All right, is this microinvasive squamous cell carcinoma? It looks like we've got sort of an exophytic uh, tumor and then we've got these small irregular nests extending down into here. Uh, so do we call this microinvasive squamous cell carcinoma? If you said yes, trick question. Uh, there are not criteria for, using, for use of the term microinvasive. So you could use a term like early stromal invasion or uh, squamous cell carcinoma minimally invasive, uh, some sort of term like that. Uh, but if you use the term microinvasion, people may have an idea what you're going to think, uh, but that's not a, a morphologic, uh, pathologic term that we want to associate with a particular or specific entity at this point. All right, how about this lesion? What do we see? Well, we see cells with a lot of clear cytoplasm, some nuclear atypia, 
a fair amount of epithelial type differentiation maybe. So we could be thinking clear cell carcinoma, we could be thinking maybe uh, clear cell sarcoma or something like that. But if we said uh, clear cell carcinoma, you'd be right. And uh, related to that, does this tumor typically have a P53 mutation? Well, we didn't talk about that in the lecture. And so if you'd only know the answer if you were really listening closely or had done some reading. Uh, but again, um, this is kind of a trick question. Uh, some of these clear cell carcinomas of the uh, vagina can have increased staining relative to adjacent tissue, but it will be heterogeneous rather than mutated. Uh, and to sort of quote a colleague's uh, observation, uh, we believe that P53 overexpression in clear cell carcinomas of the vagina and cervix is a response to generalized DNA damage rather than a result of a P53 protein half-life prolongation from a mutational inactivation of P53. So in contrast to ovarian clear cell carcinoma, which has a P53 mutation status, uh, and most endometrial uh, clear cell carcinoma, excuse me, uh, ovarian clear cell carcinoma, which may have a mutational status uh, that is uh, of concern there. Did I say that right? Ovarian clear cell carcinoma may have a P53 mutation, but not uniformly. So um, let's leave it with that. I was thinking serious carcinoma, of course, is P53 mutated. So is this sarcomatoid carcinoma or is this aggressive angiomyxoma or is this uh, something else? Well, if you said fibroepithelial polyp, you were correct. And then lastly, quick uh, image pattern recognition, mitotic figure, spindle cell, fascicular growth, six centimeter mass, but it showed up three weeks after discharge um, for another procedure. What are you thinking? Well, of course, you're thinking postoperative spindle cell nodule. The tumor presents a few weeks following hysterectomy or some other surgical procedure in the same region and uh, presents as a vaginal mass. Gross differential diagnosis, fibroepithelial polyp, sarcoma botryoides, other. Those are the things to be thinking. Here is the histology. You see the squamous epithelium. You see this cellular proliferative zone of atypical cells. This is the cambium layer and an embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. Now, just a word quickly about staging for embryonal rhabdomyosarcomas. Uh, this is the uh, post-surgical stage grouping of the rhabdomyosarcoma gr inner group. Uh, there's another stage grouping based on pathologic features. Um, and so I'd refer you to the CAP protocol to look for these in terms of localized tumor, uh, versus uh, microscopic residual disease, locally extensive, et cetera, et cetera. Recognizing that uh, this is a surgical staging process uh, rather than a strictly pathologic uh, staging. So uh, with that uh, quick note, uh, I thank you for joining me. And if you have questions, please uh, send me an email, uh, send me a, a, a Facebook message or otherwise uh, reach out to me. I'm happy to answer those and enjoy engaging with you. And if you have suggestions for the channel, I welcome those as well. We hope you'll subscribe, uh, comment below, uh, add uh, your uh, um, uh, comments or, or uh, suggestions for how we can improve things, topics you'd like to hear about in the future. And until next time, have a good day. Good day.